Hi guys. I have an obsession with all things history, mystery, conspiracy, and paranormal. I love to do deep dives on topics, but I generally stumble upon Shirley by chance. And I love to tell stories. So welcome to Sit and Spin. Today, um, I had originally promised a tinfoil hat story. Turns out that hole is so deep, I'm still writing the script. So I thought, rather than delay for another week and not get a sit and spin this month, that I would do a quick one on a interesting Japanese mystery, and then I will get to the tinfoil hat one next month. I'm just waiting on a book to finish my research. Yes, actually ordered a book to research this topic. This hole is deep, man, deep. But for today, let's get creepy. I have this lovely alpaca silk blend that I got in my fiber of the month. That would have been March. Now, because it's alpaca and silk, it's not going to have any memory. So I'm going to spin very fine for a lace weight. Now, I, it's going to get on everything, so my bright blue dress is going to be covered in fuzzies, and I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I'll just clean it all off when I'm done. So for now, let's spin a yarn. On July 24th, 1989, two hikers were ascending Asahadaki Mountain in Hokkaido, Japan. I'm going to take a moment to say my Japanese is horrible, so I apologize for all these miserable pronunciations, but let's get into it. Due to weather conditions and incorrect navigational marks, these hikers went off the trail and were lost. Rescuers were searching for them via helicopter when they came across a giant SOS laid out on the ground, 16 feet long and 10 feet wide, it was made from birch logs, and it was near the start of the Chubasagawa River. Again, I'm horrible with Japanese. Actually, I'm horrible with everything, including English. The rescuers circled the area and found the two missing mountaineers safe, about two to three kilometers north of the sign. After the rescue, the H Hokkaido police mentioned to the hikers that they were rescued due to their sign being spotted. But the hikers were like, dude, what? What sign? We don't know what you're talking about. The police are like, okay, let's turn around, go back, have a look at this sign and show it to them. So they did. They hadn't made any sign. They had just hunkered down in a cave to await rescue. There was a chilling moment of realization as everyone involved realized someone else was down there and asking for help. These two hikers had been rescued completely by coincidence. It was too late in the day for another ground search, so the helicopter had to return to base for the night, and a second search was organized for the next day. So first thing in the morning, the helicopter flew out the police for the ground search and dropped them at the SOS sign, which was located about four kilometers away from the peak of Mount Asahidaki. Near the sign, they made a gruesome discovery and what everyone had been afraid they were going to find. Scattered human bones with animal gnaw marks. There was no flesh left at all, so the body had been there for a while. The bones were sent to the Asahikawa Medical University, where they were identified as female with a blood type of O. Also, in their search, just about a hundred meters away from the SOS sign, sign, they found a discarded backpack. Inside were the expected items like toothpaste, soap, and a towel, but there were also four cassette tapes and a tape recorder. Most of the tapes were just theme songs of popular Japanese anime, but one had an eerie message recorded that lasted two minutes and 17 seconds though only 16 seconds of the recording has ever been available to the public. The message translates as follows. I'm on a cliff and can't move. 
SOS, help me. I'm at the spot where I first saw the helicopter. The bamboo grass is too deep and I can't go anywhere. Please lift me up from here. The message is yelled into the recorder, each syllable punctuated with a pause for breath. Let's have a listen to this. So that was an excerpt of the original recording being played for the public. But wait a second. The remains they found were female. That voice is definitely male. So does this mean there's a second body waiting to be found? A Japanese reporter who was searching the mountain found a hole inside a tree, a place that was big enough that someone could also have sheltered in there during bad weather. And inside he found two cameras, a notebook, and an identification card for Kenji Awamura of Konan City, Achi Prefecture. So this is more confirmation that there's still a man missing on that mountain that needs to be found. The police sent a request to the Asahikawu Medical University to re-examine the bones. Well, guess what? The new results said the bones belonged to a man with a blood type of A. Apparently, misidentification of skeletal remains was very common in the early days of forensic science. With all the tools we have today, it seems a little ridiculous that such a mix-up could happen, but in the 80s, apparently it wasn't uncommon. Nobody found this complete turnaround at all strange. Regardless, at least now they knew who their skeleton was. 25-year-old Kenji Awamura, who had been missing since July 11th, 1984, so five years earlier. Kenji, who was on vacation celebrating a promotion at work, had been staying at a nearby lodge and decided to go for a hike up the Ashahadaki Mountain. It is a relatively short hike up, but on the way back down, there is a distinct blocky boulder called the Safe and it's used as a landmark to indicate the trail back to town. Unfortunately, flooding and erosion placed a second blocky boulder similar in size and shape to the safe landmark very near the trail as well. But that boulder leads to a trail that crosses back to a steep cliff. This second dangerous route has since been blocked, but at the time, it was easy enough to veer off the safe path. In fact, that's what happened to the hikers at the start of our story. So, Kenji was reported missing, either by the lodge owner or by his parents when he didn't show up at work a week later. Reports are mixed on this, and the Japanese have different standards for reporting and privacy, so it's difficult to confirm who actually reported Kenji missing. In fact, Kenji is often not even identified by name in the press and has alternately been identified as Morita Katsuhiki, Kat Katsuhiko, there we go, Katsuhiko, who worked in an auto parts factory. But most sources identify him as Kenji Awamura. And since I love the name Kenji, that's what I'm going with. So Kenji's parents were contacted and they did identify the, back, the backpack as belonging to him, although they weren't certain that the voice on the tape was their son's. Now there's been a lot of conspiracies about that, but I think the simple truth is, is that with the way he was shouting and how poorly handheld recorders recorded your voice, that it should be expected that they couldn't be sure that that was actually Kenji. Now, as upsetting as the recording is, it's also extremely puzzling. On the tape, Kenji says he's on a cliff and stuck in the bamboo. The bones and the tape 
were found next to the SOS sign in the wetlands near a large river. So how did he get there? It seems that initially he thought it would be extremely dangerous to climb down the, tr the cliffs, but he later risked it and reached the open area where he created the SOS sign. So let's take a moment and discuss the SOS sign. It was made of large birch trees, 19 in total. Overall, it was 19 feet long, so from S to S, and 10 feet high, so from top to bottom, with logs stacked as many as three high throughout. It's a lot of work for one person to laboriously haul and stack heavy hardwood logs. But here's another strange thing. The skeleton had two fractures, one leg and one upper body, the shoulder. There is no way a man with those injuries could have hauled those logs. On the tape, Kenji had made no mention of injuries, so maybe we can assume that the fractures happened later. But at the time of the recording, he was still on the cliff. It would be logical to think that the fractures happened while descending, which would again mean he couldn't make the sign. For now, let's just accept that he made the sign before the accident that led to the fractures, and let's just go back to looking at this sign. The sign had been out in the open, exposed to weather and overgrowth for five years. So anyone who's ever had a yard knows how quickly grass and weeds can grow and cover anything. But these logs were still clearly visible five years later. They had all been chopped down with a hatchet or a knife, so they were fresh at the start. The logs themselves probably would not have rotted away in five years. But the vegetation should definitely have covered them. And it did. There were periodic aerial photos taken in the region, and the police thought they'd start by examining those. The first one they had was taken in 1982, and there's no sign of the SOS letters. But in the 1987 photo, they are visible. So we know that for certain the sign was made sometime between 1982 and 1987. But was it who Kenji who made it or someone else entirely? If you look at the list of what was found with the body, there's no tree cutting tools. There's no hatchet, no knife, no survival string saw like was common at the time. And in only five years, the metal would still be intact. If Kenji wasn't injured until after he built the sign, then his energy would have been better used to continue downhill and follow the river. Remember, he wasn't that far from the river. He could see the river. And eventually, a river is going to bring you to civilization. So why would he spend all this time cutting and hauling these nine hardwood trees to make an SOS sign? From the tape, we can construe a rough timeline of the events. So Kenji hiked up the trail, coming back down, he turned at the wrong rock and was stuck on the top of the cliff, surrounded by thick bamboo. At some point, he saw a helicopter, thought it was searching for him, although this has never been confirmed. He recorded the tape, making it as loud as he could, presumably, presumably, to play back when his own voice would give out from extended yell. After an undetermined period of time, he must have decided the helicopter wasn't coming back or wouldn't be able to see him. He found a way to descend the cliff. Then he likely spent days making the huge SOS sign in the marsh. At some point afterwards, he broke two bones and died, at which point animal scavengers remains, and he lay undiscovered for five years. After just one week of investigating, this became the official record and the case was closed. But there's still so many questions that this case is still theorized about until today.
mostly because of the eerie recording and the damn sign. Could Kenji really have made it on his own? And if he didn't, who helped him? Or maybe he didn't make it at all. Maybe he did sustain his injuries descending the cliff and coincidence had him dying near the sign. Or maybe someone else entirely made the sign after his death with no idea his body was there. Or maybe they did find his body but didn't want to report it for whatever reason so they made the sign so it would be discovered. Or <clears throat> there's just so many questions. Well, I can't leave you without any kind of answer, so I have written my own theory about what happened with Kenji. So here we go. Kenji wanders off the safe trail, trapped on top of the cliff with the bamboo. He saw a helicopter, but it didn't see him. He recorded the tape and left it playing while he rested, but he soon realized no one was coming. He tried to descend the cliff, but he fell and he injured himself in the process. He's still determined though. He's going to drag himself out of there. He's trying to reach open ground, hoping to single help from there. He sheltered in a tree where he left some of his belongings before continuing on. He didn't make it far, however, before he succumbed to his injuries. His spirit continued to haunt the woods. Another hiker innocently trekking through the woods one day, encounters Kenji's spirit. Kenji told them what happened, but they knew that they would never be able to convince the police to search for a body based on the words of a ghost. So the hiker built the SOS. Kenji's spirit was then content to wait. But one day, he saw these two hikers lost the same way he had been lost, and he didn't want them to die. So he guided them to a safety, the safety of a cave near the SOS so that they would be saved and Kenji's remains could finally be found and he would be laid to rest. At least that's how it works in my head. What do you think? Do you have your own tale of how all this happened? Share it with me in the comments. I hope you've enjoyed a good yarn. Thanks for joining me. And I'll see you next time. Bye.